Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, and we resume our study in verse 37. Matthew 26, verse 37. Get your Bible if you can so that you can follow along and read your Bible right along with me. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is another place where you can study the Bible in its entirety. Genesis through Revelation, four series. And all you have to do is choose the series and choose the book of the Bible, the chapter, the section. Click and listen. All you need is your Bible and a hunger for God's Word at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out today. Study God's Word the way he gave it, one verse at a time. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, verse 37. Let's begin reading in verse 36 of Matthew chapter 26. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And he saith, unto the disciples, sit here while I go and pray yonder. Jesus is about to engage in spiritual warfare here, and his weapon is prayer. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very depressed. Jesus prayed alone many times, but this time he wanted his three closest friends to be with him. The disciples James and John were Jesus's cousins, and Peter, of course, was Peter. And those three men were his closest apostles and he wanted their company. And he wanted them to pray, too. He didn't want their prayers for himself. And as I mentioned last time, I think, Jesus does not need our prayers. There's one exception. Jesus had a prayer request that I pray every day. Remember what he said? Pray the Lord. Pray, pray to the Father that he would raise up laborers to work in his field because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So every day I pray that God will raise up preachers who will boldly proclaim his word. And I always had to, and I pray that I'm one of them. But other than that, I don't recall Jesus ever having a prayer request. He's the Lord of our prayers. He never needs to be the subject of our prayers. Verse 38, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. If we need to remember that Jesus is 100% human so that we can appreciate just how unselfish he is, then this is a good place to go to in, in the Bible. He's about to be punished for our sins, which means the cross. He will be blasted with guilt and physical punishment and spiritual death, which is separation from God. And the pain of crucifixion on top of everything else, all of, all of that he will go through voluntarily for us. He could have called the whole thing off anytime he wanted to, but he doesn't want to. As much as he doesn't want to go through it in his flesh, the idea of calling it off is abhorrent to him. He would not do that. He loved us too much. So all of these things that are on his mind, all of that, 
that he's going to do for us. And the thought of it is about to kill him here in the garden. I think they're pretty shaky. Verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. God's will is not always fun. God's will certainly is not always the easy road. God's will was painful for Jesus. It called for self-sacrifice. And he would like to skip it, if possible. But he says, Father, I'll do your will. I won't let you down. 40. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And he saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? The prayer that Jesus prayed in verse 39, Not my will, but your will be done, only takes a few seconds to pray, which means that we must only have a small sample of the prayers and the agony that Jesus went through in the garden. He must have prayed much more than that, which was not inspired by God to write down. He prayed and he agonized and he suffered on the ground for an hour before he checked in with Peter, James, and John to see how they were doing and what they were doing. And they were sleeping. 41. Jesus said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is prone to sin. If we're Christians, we want to please God. If we're Christians, we want to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. But our flesh is prone to sin. And if we're going to beat it, then we have to do what Jesus said right here. Watch and pray. Praying will make your spirit stronger than your flesh. And that's what needs to happen in order to conquer sin. It really is an amazing thing how prayer will give you the determination and strength to say no to the pull of your sin nature. Prayer will keep you from sin. You're not going to commit sin when you're in the midst of talking to God. You're not, when you're in fervent prayer, heartfelt prayer to God, you're not gonna you're not gonna commit sin. Forty two. And the more you pray, the stronger your spirit will be. For when you're done praying. Forty two. And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Sometimes we have to really bear down and pray long and pray hard. There are times when the pull of our flesh to walk away from God's will is very strong. There are times when the battle with our emotions is fierce. During those times, we have to continue in prayer until our spirits have put out the fire of our flesh. Jesus' human will wasn't yet in total agreement with the will of the Father, but it's getting closer as he continues to pray. He says again, not my will, but thy will be done. 43, and he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. They probably tried to stay awake. But there was a point where they just couldn't do that. You've been there, I bet you. I have. You try and try and try 
to stay awake, but there comes a point where whatever it is, the fatigue is so strong that you just, you can't. You absolutely can't. 44. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words. I've heard people say, well, if you pray the same prayer twice, then you lack faith and you're not going to get what you ask for. I, how stupid can some people be? Seriously. How stupid can some Bible teachers be to make statements like that? I've heard it. You pray the same prayer twice, you don't have faith and you're not going to get what you ask for. Just really. Was that right, mister? Would you please would you please read verse 44 again? It says that Jesus prayed the third time saying the same thing. Then cometh he to his disciples, <clears throat> excuse me, and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So, the window of opportunity for them to pray has passed. The window of opportunity for them to stand by Jesus during this most difficult time in the garden is also past. They might as well continue to sleep now. When it's time for God to use us, when the time has arrived, the time of preparation is over. Verse 46, rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Jesus did not run and he did not hide. <clears throat> he went out to meet those who came to arrest him. And by the way, that is the only way to do God's will. Whether it's exciting or tedious, fun, difficult, frightening, terrifying. Do what God wants you to do without regret, without hesitation. Just get at it. It's God's will. Okay, I'm going to do it. And I'll just leave the results to God. Doesn't do any good to sit around and think about it. Just do it. Get at it. Face it head on. So Jesus said, let's go. He's going out to meet these guys. He's going out to meet these men who came to arrest him. Not hiding behind a tree or even waiting for them to come to him. 47, and while he yet spoke, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Sinful man sometimes treats God as if he is a criminal who has done something wrong. I've heard the Christian psychologist say, it's good for you to get angry at God. It's good for you to show your anger toward God. What a bunch of baloney. I'm telling you, these guys are useless. Totally useless. Anyone who spends more time studying their psychology books and psychotherapy theories and, and techniques more than the word of God isn't going to be of any use to Jesus Christ. Sinful man treats God as a criminal and it's, and it's as unjustified as anything could possibly be. Judas brought a bunch of men with clubs and swords to arrest Jesus as if he is some, some sort of a criminal. We should never even entertain the thought that God is ever unfair or ever does anything wrong. To accuse God of being unfair or wrong about anything is to treat him like a criminal, just as Judas and the gang who came to arrest him did. And I'm out of time. If you would like to be a part of this ministry, you can be. You can pray for me. 
and pray for the Word of God. And when you take a break from studying at the BibleVerseByVerse.com, if you would click the donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, that'd be wonderful. Again, stand with me. Let's get out God's Word together. Verse by verse, the whole counsel of God sure is needed, isn't it? See you next time.